Praise the Lord. So, we are picking up in verse Thessalonians 4 and 5, ending this incredible book. Paul's been talking about a lot of things already that have been really, really amazing. Hope you've been getting a lot out of this already. So once again, this is an overview, so we're not going to go into every single scripture. I'm not going to read all of them today. Just hitting on a couple key points of what we can really, really get out of this that I think God wants to reveal to us all. So remember, the reason why we're going to start a couple of verses of the last verses of, ver of chapter 3 before we get into verse 4 or chapter 4 is because remember, we want to continue on the thought. The Bible was not written with chapter and verses. So this is one continuous letter to this amazing church. And we're going to go ahead from chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Now may our God and Father himself, our Lord Jesus, clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Amen. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. So that's how this last chapter was going. Let's continue on with the thought. Finally now, brothers. See, he can say finally because of what he's already said. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. So this church is different for Paul. This church is actually pleasing God. He's writing to this church saying, you know what? Y'all are doing amazing. Y'all are doing great. There are some things we need to talk about. But he said, honestly, y'all are pleasing God. You guys are living in a way that is bringing pleasure to the face of the Lord. Don't you want to be that way? I'm praying that every single one of us know that we live for His good pleasure. When's the last time you woke up and you said, you know what, today, God, I just want to please you. What am I going to do today, Lord, that can please you at my business, at my job, with my family? Are you watching your actions, the things you're saying? Are they pleasing to the Lord? Are you running everything you do in your life through the test of does this truly please God? And when you go to sleep at night, do you feel you have the smile of the Lord of how you lived your day? Remember, my dad always used to say this. My daddy's been preaching 51 years now. He said, the greatest pillow you can ever sleep on is a clear conscience. I love that. Do you go to sleep at night saying, you know what? And you feel and just know the pleasure of God is with you because you really did everything within your strength to partner with the Holy Spirit who could give you the power to please him. Remember Philippians 2.13, beautiful scripture. For it is God who gives us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You see, maybe you have some desires. God's been changing your desires. You've been getting in the growth book. You've been studying. You've been getting in the word of God. You're starting to know what his desires are. You're starting to know what his mindset is. You're starting to know the way he thinks, the way he talks. Maybe those desires are beginning to infiltrate your desires. That's amazing. But many Christians have great desires, but no follow through. But God is the God who gives us desires, his own desires. But he also gives us the power to follow through. Are you living your life in a way where you're asking God, am I pleasing you when it comes to my family, Lord? Am I pleasing you with the way I treat my wife, my husband? God, am I pleasing you with the way I talk to my kids? God, am I pleasing you with the way I work? The Bible says don't work unto men, but work unto the Lord. Are you constantly asking, is what I'm doing pleasing to God? He will give you his desires when you seek him, when you're in his word, but he will also give you the power to follow through. Hallelujah. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. You see, you can become more and more pleasing to God. Did you know that? Did you know that God can't love you any more than he already does? God's love never grows for you. Think about that. His love does not grow for you. For people, maybe their love grows for you. As you, uh, if, for instance, when you get married to somebody, your love does grow for your spouse. It matures over time. God's love does not mature for you. His love does not grow for you. He already loves you with the highest love that could ever be. He loves you with perfect, complete love. God's love for you is so complete and perfect, nothing can be added to it. That's how much God loves you. 
But he does say that you can be more and more pleasing to him. He says that my love for you is never going to change. You can serve me. You don't serve me. I'm still going to love you. you. Before you were saved, the Bible said God already loved you. So it wasn't a based on what you were doing for the Lord. His love isn't based on that. But how much he's pleased with you is in your control. How much he loves you is not within your control. How much he's pleased with you is within our control. He says, I ask and urge you to the Lord to do this more and more. Continue to live more and more in a way that pleases God. Hallelujah. Let's be more and more pleasing to the Lord. He gives us a couple ways to do this. Verse 3, for it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, let's just pause real quick. Sanctification is different than consecration. Consecration is what God does to you when you get saved. He consecrates you, meaning he anoints you and sets you apart for the purpose that he had planned for you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. So now you've been consecrated. When you got saved, you received Jesus and his sacrifice that he did on the cross. You have now been consecrated. God did this. He set you apart. He said, now I can anoint you for the purpose that I have always given you, that I already had for you before you were formed in your mother's womb, now that you've accepted me. But sanctification is what we do to ourselves. Consecration God does to us sanctification we do for ourselves. We choose to be sanctified. We choose to walk this out with God. We choose daily to live in this way. And this is what verse 3 goes on to say. It said that you should avoid, for instance, sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust, just like the heathen who do not know God. And that is this matter. No one should be wrong to take advantage of him. Okay, so listen. He's saying these are just a couple of ways that you're in control of. You're in control of your own body. You're in control of your sexual urges. You actually don't have to live enslaved to those. I now give you power, according to Romans chapter 6. We now have power to discipline and not allow our bodies and our lusts to get out of control. He says you got to sanctify yourself daily by choosing to be set apart. You see, listen, this is very important. When God consecrates you, he sets you apart. Many are called, the Bible says, but few are chosen. What does that mean? Everybody, when they receive Jesus, they are called. Every one of us are called. Even before you receive Jesus, you have a calling, but you got to receive Jesus and know him to find out what that calling is. But every one of us are called. But those who sanctify themselves are the ones who choose to be chosen. It's not God calls everybody and then he says, but I only actually only choose you, you and you. That's not how it works. God calls everybody. He chose a purpose for everybody. But you through sanctifying yourself, the daily decisions of being more pleasing to God, choose to set yourself apart and become chosen. One of the chosen by God because you chose to be chosen. Hallelujah. Verse 7, For God did not call us to be impure, but He called us to live a holy life. So you understand that. Part of your calling, every single believer's calling, and here's part of your calling. You want to know what your calling is? Here's one of them. Many things in the Bible, but here's one of the things God says. I called you to live a pure and holy life. God has called you to purity. Do you know you've been called? It's part of your purpose in life is to be pure. Not just the preacher, not the pastor, not the prophet, but for you to live pure. Hallelujah. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, God has given you this instruction. Live pure. Live holy. So if you reject that instruction, you're not rejecting a preacher who's trying to tell you you need to be pure. You're a DG group leader who's trying to tell you you need to be pure. Uh, your wife who's, your husband who's trying to tell you you need to be pure. You're not rejecting them. This actually is a command higher than them. It's coming from God. So when you reject that command, you're rejecting God himself, not a person. Hallelujah. Verse 13, let's skip down. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Those who fall asleep means those who die. The Bible calls it falling asleep if you're a believer. We call it death. Ooh, this is so good. You see, when you go to a funeral, if you have a friend who has died, but they were a believer, or a father, or a mother, or anybody, they've died, but they're a believer, the Bible does not call them dead. 
it says they've fallen asleep. And God and Paul is saying, I don't want you to grieve the way everybody else grieves. I don't want you to be at that funeral grieving the way everybody else grieves. He says, watch this. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So if you're a believer and you die, you actually have simply fallen asleep for here on earth, but you have now opened your eyes and awoken in front of Jesus. You see, so for believers, funerals are not supposed to be necessarily sad events. I totally understand they're still going to be crying because we're going to miss those people in their presence here. But for a believer, death is not the end. Death is, I'll see you later. It is not the end. It is, I'll see you later. I had an extended family member who passed away just recently and we were there by her bed and we were praying and we were worshiping God. And, uh, you know what was so amazing? I was crying because of course I'd miss her, but I was also so overjoyed and happy. Why? Because it's all just see you later. I'll see you later, girl. I'll see you later. Just a matter of time. We're just separated for just a little while. The Bible says, Paul said, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment you fall asleep on this earth or die, the moment your eyes open in heaven and you're with Jesus. It's a moment. It's a moment. It's not like this purgatory wait period of time. We're not waiting for hours or days or months, depending on how you live. If you are a blood-washed saint, washed by the blood of Jesus, anybody that you know who has been washed by the blood of Jesus, received his sacrifice on the cross, The moment they close their eyes in death, they open their eyes to be with the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. That's why he says you don't have to grieve the same way that they grieve. That's not their body. If you have an open casket viewing, some people do open casket, some people do cremation, whatever it might be that you choose. Just understand, if you're walking by that casket, that's not them. That was what Paul calls a tent, a, a, a body, a covering, a house that we lived in for a temporary period of time. But we are a spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. We live in a tent. That tent is left behind. Our spirit, who is our true self, goes up to be with the Lord. Remember, the Bible does not call it death for a believer. They call it falling asleep. This is so powerful. To be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. The moment you close your eyes, you're with Jesus. We can be excited about this. We can have hope about this. We can be excited about this. For a believer, it's a day of celebration. Anybody ever comes to my funeral, they're not going to be playing no sad songs. I just want you to know, I'm going to have a full praise team up there. We're going to be dancing. We're going to be jumping around. It's going to be a party. Because let me tell you something. I'm not in heaven worrying about you. (laughs) I won't be in heaven sad or thinking about nothing else. I'm going to be with Jesus. All right, let's go to chapter 5. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, the day of judgment. Peace and safety and destruction will come on them suddenly for those who are saying peace and safety. Destruction is going to come to those people. You see, guys, we got to be ready. Be vigilant. Be alert. Always. Always be living in a way. That's why chapter 4 was talking about pleasing God, living in a way that will please the Lord. Let's go to chapter 5, verse 6. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. So this is a different kind of asleep. This isn't the falling asleep of dying. This is now like you actually are just like unaware. You're not living in a self-controlled way. You're not being alert of the enemy's schemes. What if First Peter said? He said, though, the devil crouches about going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You got to be aware of his schemes. You got to be aware of his traps. Let's live in a way that we're always ready at any time that if Jesus came back, we have peace with God, right? Maybe some of y'all grew up in a church and that's all they talked about. Rapture ready. We got to be rapture ready. At any moment he can come, rapture ready. My God. And maybe it just scared the life out of you. (laughs) Maybe you just lived as a Christian, just scared. Anytime he could come back, am I ready? Oh, Lord, I think I just said something bad. Lord, God, forgive me real quick, just in case you come through the ceiling right now. I'm not talking about living in in, in nervousness or anxiety. I'm talking about living a way that pleases the Lord. And let's be alert and self-controlled. Hallelujah. Verse 12. 
Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and to demonish you. I just wanted to point this out real quick, that those people who have taken care of you, DG leaders, pastors, uh, bosses, whether they're saved or unsaved, all these people who are working hard, who are working hard, you need to honor them. But also, especially those who are in the Lord, those godly people who are taking care of you. It says in verse 13, hold them in highest regard and in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Hold those people in high regard. It doesn't mean put them on a pedestal. It doesn't mean you're going to make pastors, you know, into an idol in your life. It doesn't mean you need to treat anybody like a celebrity. There are no celebrities but Jesus. Can I say that again? There are no celebrities in Christianity. Jesus is the only celebrity. The highest calling any of us get is a foot washer. I'm going to say it again. There are no celebrities in Christianity. The highest calling we have is as a foot washer. We get to serve. Thank you, Jesus. So these are the last few things it says. These are all incredible. Let me just read these to you. Verse 14. Warn those who are idle or lazy. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Man, I'm going to take that all day long, all week long, and I'm needing some help with this one. Be patient. <laughs> Be patient with everyone. Y'all ever struggle with patience? Woo! Be patient. How many of y'all would be amazing Christians if there were just no other people? <laughs> right? You know, but we got to be patient with everyone. God will help us to be patient. Thank you, Lord. Verse 16, be joyful always. Pray, be joyful always. My goodness. Always. Always I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Wow. Okay. Well, we got to be joyful always. There's some reasons you don't think you have joy. But joy is not dependent upon your feeling. Joy is a supernatural thing that we get in the presence of God. The Bible says that in His presence is the fullness of joy. So in His presence, we get to have joy when it doesn't make sense, okay? Pray continually. We're praying in the Holy Ghost. As you walk throughout your day, you're praying continuously. Praying continuously, thanking. Give thanks in all circumstances. Man, that's a challenge. Give thanks because God is bigger. You can trust him. You can trust him. For this is God's will for you according to Christ. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Another version says don't quench him. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, but he also can be quenched. He can be grieved, meaning he can be hurt, but he can literally be put out. Wow. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Don't just take it lightly if God says something. Don't just take it lightly if there's a prophecy. What you got to do, this is what the Bible says. You got to test everything, next verse, and then hold on to what is good. So if you receive prophecies before, you don't just believe them necessarily, but you say, okay, Lord, it, you know, if you want this to come to place in my life, I believe this and this, this sounds great, and Lord, I'd love that to come to play. I'm going to test this to see if it's really you. What's the biggest test if a prophecy is real? Time. See if it actually happens over time as you align with what God wants you to do. And then you hold on to what is good. Throw out everything else. Hold on to what is good. God will show you what to do. God bless you today. I hope this has been an amazing chapter, a couple chapters for you. It's a really incredible uh, honor to come to you with the word of God. We love you so much. Bless you today. Have an amazing week as you go through this. Take time on it. Get some worship on in the atmosphere. We love you. God bless. (laughs) 